Flip over now, if you would, and return to the book of Ecclesiastes, and we come to perhaps one of the most famous passages in maybe the whole Bible, uh, but here in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. It's been made into songs, it's made its way to the number one of the billboard charts before. The very lyrics here uh, found in this poem in the early part of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And I think that's true, not only for catching tunes and for its own sake, but of course, this is often read at funerals, and we return to this text because it resonates with us in so many ways, because it just shows the whole breadth of life. But even as we run through this book, Ecclesiastes, here, Solomon, he's trying to unearth what is life all about, what is the purpose to why we're here and what we're to be doing, especially as he looks mainly under the sun, that is, if you take God out of the picture, what can I make of this life? Here's what he discovers as he's in chapter 3. He just reflects and looks at our life and sees the whole spectrum. And frankly, he finds it confusing. I mean, do you ever feel like that you're getting you know, some part of this living thing down, and then once you do, the game just changes, right? The playing field shifts, the target moves, and, and then you're just having to start over and refigure this whole thing out again. You know, maybe it was at first, as a child, you're figuring out the whole schooling thing. Like, okay, here, here's how I need to please my teachers, uh, here's how I make friends in that environment, and then you move into high school, and it's just like a big jumble, everything changes. Or then you move on to college, and, and, and everything just starts over. The relationships are a reset. Also trying to figure out the demands of your professor who just calls you a number instead of your name. Or, or maybe you take the whole dating and marriage endeavor. You know, you had a crush on a girl in grade school, and then, then you dated that girl, or courted, excuse me, you know, a girl later on. You wooed her, and you charmed her, and then she married you. But then only in time you discover that, yes, you're married, but that doesn't mean your relationship is easy, or that closeness is automatic, does it? And so then you have to adjust and change a whole new way of trying to relate to this person you love. Or maybe it's your job and occupation. You know, you finally figured out what you wanted to study or work at in school, so then you majored in that, and then you start looking for jobs, and the field's not opening up, so then you think, what else can I do with a philosophy major? And, and you find out nothing. <laughs> but then you get a job, and maybe it's the job you didn't really want, but it's a job, and then you get an offer for another position, and then you take that one, wow, this is sounding good, and then you get fired two years later, and you're starting all over again. At each stage in life, we just live off balance, don't we? We're always having to learn, we're always changing, and we're not figuring out any of it until it seems like the season's over and we're ready to move on. And then you're on to the next one. And so you can find then that life is most unsettling as you try and find the bottom, you try and find to get to the answer to life's mysterious purpose. And as soon as you think you got it, everything changes. Things are just never that simple. But once you bring God into view, which this is one of those rare cases, actually, in the book of Ecclesiastes, God comes to the forefront of this book. Once you bring God into view to look at life from God's perspective, from the perspective of his truth and his word, the disorderly becomes ordered, then the chaotic becomes, well, he'll call it beautiful, because the great and good God stands behind all of it, all of our life in every season in it. The word for us this morning is rest. Rest in God's control of our times to find meaning for your otherwise confusing life. We do well to rest, to trust, to rely on God, follow His word, even as we look at our life and we say, this is chaotic, this is confusing. You can't make any sense of this. That's right, you can't, but God has. And He has a sense and a plan behind it. Rely upon Him. Trust Him. Look at him. Solomon will teach us this really by a series of negatives as we work through this text, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. For what we're going to see is that apart from God, one, life will never be simple. Two, life will never make sense. Aren't you encouraged? And then finally, life will never seem just. All of those things are true apart from God. But then you bring God into picture and things start to fall into place. So let's see that unfold. Let's look at this first one. That apart from God, life will never be simple. Solomon opens chapter 3 with these iconic words. Verse 1. For 
everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. There is a season for everything. Now, season here, I think a point in time, like a, like a scheduled event. God has set the calendar for your world and your life. That there's a specific, appointed, determined time for everything, for every season, for every part of your life that happens. And if that be the case, in the world we live in, we realize then, this isn't anything but a random world. Things don't happen by chance, nor are the events and season of our lives left up to fate, to fortune, to the random, or to happenstance of just flying molecules. No, there's an intention behind all of it, even if you can't see it, and even if you can't understand it. And it's there because as Solomon's lyrics in this following poem about, about our living and our life, from beginning to end, you see, as you look at our world, it's actually seems to be comprised of opposites. That's what makes it so not simple and so confusing. It, it, it's comprised of these confusing contradictions. If you just think about your life. You, you know, you want one thing, you go after it, and then the seasons change, the circumstances shift, and then you find yourself, you're going after the exact opposite thing. And all in due time. Look at the beauty of this poem that Solomon has penned. Of course, you recognize each line is balanced by a time for this and a time for that all the way through. But he hasn't picked just random events that he pairs together. But again, see that he pairs opposites. He's looking at the very extremes. Look at verse 2. There's a time to be born, and then there's a time to die. There's a time to plant, and then a time to pluck up what has been planted. You see this clear antithesis as he looks at the scope of our life. You know, on the one hand, you plant something. And then on the other hand, you have to pluck up what you've been planted. And so he uses these same words, plant and planted, on each side of this to show. He's showing opposites. This, this summarizes your life. It's driven by extremes of opposites. Of course, we, we see these truths playing out in our yards and neighborhoods right now these days, don't we? We've been plucking up weeds, we've been spraying weed killer, and now we're going to go be planting, right? Seeds and fertilizing the yard. Or you're taking up bushes that a year before you put in, because now they're dead. At least in my yard. Our lives can be made of the most divergent activities. If you look at the whole spectrum of it, look down to verse 5. There's a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace, but then a time to refrain from embracing. We go back to the backyard or to your garden. It, we spend our time destoning the ground so we have good, suitable soil for our plants. But then the next day, the next year maybe, you're gathering all those storms, stones because you're going to build a wall or a fence or some thing in your garden. Or you may even go to Lowe's and buy the very same stones that you had thrown away to decorate your yard. Here's the point. Our lives are not stagnant. We, we are always having to change. And this means life, it's not simple. We can't be simplistic or overly simplified about our lives, its meanings and our goals and our preoccupations in this world. It, it's like you're trying to live or stand on both sides of a seesaw. You can't stay in the middle. So you have to go to one side or the other. When you do, everything shifts, everything changes. All the balance goes one, all the weight goes one way or the other. And such that it makes getting clarity, a single focus, and direction in this life, makes it really hard. It makes it confusing. It means it's not simple. It's not straightforward. Just like if you take the final verse of this poem as an example, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. Now, if you try and get too simplistic with this, you know, turn yourself into having a bumper sticker-like philosophy for life, you're going to get into trouble. Okay? We see this, of course, with our culture right now. We have just latched onto this notion of love, haven't we? 
A time to love. And, and our culture is going to say that's all the time. You can't put boundaries on love. You can't tell me who I can or cannot love. Love always wins. Love always. Love is always good. Really. And of course love is a good thing. There's a right time for love, says Solomon says. And what about evil? Should you love evil? Are, are there times not to love? Or in the realms of relationships? What about pedophilia? Or worse? Simply speaking, if love drives everything you do, then love will have no boundaries, and you will have something very perverse that our culture, as we've seen, is running headlong down into, you see. For our lives under the sun, you can't just stay in one lane. We just don't stay the same. Our lives are not that simple. What we need to do and what we need to be about, given our season and our circumstances, are always shifting or always changing. And so as you consider the paradoxical seasons or times of your lives, you can't just boil it down to one thing, one activity, one season, one time, one occupation. Whether it's from raising children, having a great career, it's all going to change one day. The point is, if you're looking under the sun, if you're looking at life apart from God, you're going to feel like, life feels like you're riding on a boat in a raging sea. And you're being rocked back and forth violently from the bow to the stern. One day you're unpacking boxes and the next day you're packing them. One day you're saving money, and then the next day you're spending it. One day we're changing diapers, and then another day we're wearing them again. <laughs> Nevertheless, we rock between extremes. We consider again, though, as we do, verse 1. For everything there is a season. There is a time for every matter under heaven. So that is, now with God in view, with a sovereign God in view, yes, we're going to rock between extremes. And it's going to be very unsettling. But know that this is rocking by His plan, by His ordination. He's made a right time to rock for this. That is, life's going to feel out of control. That's normal for this broken world. Life's going to feel crazy, and you can't make sense of it, but God's in perfect control. And though we wonder, maybe, as it's rocking, am I going to fly off this boat? Solomon reminds us, hey, listen, this is God's boat. This is God's storm. These are God's waves. This is God's lake. None of it's beyond His control. And actually, it's right in His hands. And it might be difficult to see this at times, especially as you're looking only under the sun. But God has ordered the seasons of our life in a perfectly sensible, and He'll say, beautiful way. But you can't see that simply looking under heaven or under the sun. You have to look beyond the sun. You have to look by faith to trust in this sovereign and good God. And I have a word for us, for my soul, as we turn to this and move from this truth. And the word is contentment. Contentment. This is a huge piece of what it means to trust in a sovereign God who's sovereign over the seasons of your life. It looks like contentment. We can be content with change. We can trust Him when things shift and we lose our balance. There's a season for this. There's a time and a perfect plan for this, even if we can't see it. And because we know that whatever new season or whatever new time now is in our life, He's gone there first. He's written it ahead. He has planned and purposed this season too. You will not be entering a new phase apart from God, you see. Apart from Christ, you're in Him by faith. He goes ahead and His grace has planned it all. So, are you feeling flustered? Are you feeling unsettled? Are you stressed out with all the change, all the craziness? Solomon invites us, take a deep breath, and remember, this is just a season. A season ordained by your Father who loves you, who sent Christ to die and to rise for you. There will be confusing times and change guaranteed in this life. But when we're in Christ, that providential love never shifts. Never changes. 
Apart from God, yeah, life will never be simple. But with Him, there is a simplicity that we trust in. Secondly, life will never make sense apart from God. Verses 9 to 15. As he reviews and considers these various seasons of our lives, Solomon boils us all down. He relates all of this to this principal question, really, of the whole book. Look there at verse 9, Ecclesiastes 3. What gain has the worker from his toil? What gain has the worker for his toil? What's the point? What's the profit? He, he had said something similar as he opened the book in uh, chapter 1, verse 3, when he says... What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? What's the point? What's the purpose? Okay, so I see there's an appropriate time for everything. But what does this all say? What does this all mean? How, how does this relate to my life? Let's look back to Ecclesiastes 3. Look at verse 10. I've seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. So there's a shift here in Ecclesiastes 3, at verse 10, where... where as we've noted, so much we've been looking only under the sun. But now God comes into the picture, the business that God has given to be with the children of man. Yet Solomon's bringing God back to the forefront of our consideration. This coming paragraph in chapter 3, this is the, some of the greatest concentrations of the word God in the book of Ecclesiastes. So as we consider then all these different seasons, life seems rather unsettled and extreme on both sides. How does God fit into this? Well, first, God is in control of all of it. Look at verse 10 again. I've seen the business that God has given to the children of men to be busy with. God is the one who sets the stage. God is the author. He's the director. He's the one writing the script of our lives. He's the one who gives us the business. That is, what we need to be about. What we need to be focused on. And what is that? Well, then, we go on verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. I didn't quite get to the answer, but consider this. If the first thing we saw is that He's in control of all of this, the second thing we see is whatever He's purposed for us, whatever season that is, it is perfectly, or it says here, beautifully timed. This brings to the significance out of all of this time for this, time for that talk. That there's a season for everything. Truly it is because God's in control of it perfectly. There's a right time for everything because the sovereign God, who is all wisdom, designed it that way. You know, we're reminded of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, where it says about this God that He works all things according to the counsel of His will. There is a good, sovereign will behind each season of our life. Will we embrace that? Will we trust that sovereign Lord? Or will we lurch? Will we twist? Will we balk and complain against Him? Or will we trust? Because indeed, this is what it means to walk by faith. And not by sight. Do not judge our purpose or purposelessness. Do not determine our significance or meaninglessness. Not to establish whether God loves us or whether He doesn't. That is, we don't, we shouldn't, we can't make those judgments by our sight. By what we see happening in His world, in His providence. But we can know all those things by His promises. And so we walk not by sight, but we walk by faith. Faith in His promises, in the revealed Word of God. In other words, our feelings and our experiences don't tell us what our purpose is. That's not where we find life's meaning and what this is all about. God's Word, the promises tell us. Or in a negative sense, which he kind of spins on here, you cannot figure the answer to those questions by yourself if you're only looking under the sun, if you're only looking to yourself. Because Solomon goes on to explain, look again at verse 11. He's made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from beginning to the end. So, God designs everything to happen in His perfect time. 
But then second, at the same time, he puts eternity into the hearts of men. Now, Bible students have pastored and pastors have pondered long over what does this mean? That God puts eternity, something infinite, or a sense of it, into the finite hearts of men and women. Is this a good thing? Or is, it, is this a bad thing? Well, whatever you might think about it, looking at verse 11, it's very, this much is very clear. That eternity sits in the hearts of men and women, it proves a frustration to us. You see that? And so he's put eternity in the hearts of men, verse 11, and so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. See, God has put eternity into our hearts, this notion of the eternal, this notion of permanent, lasting things, far more than us. We have a sense there's something so much bigger than us out there, and that, and that everything's going somewhere, that there's this eternal creator, God, who has some purpose for all things. He has a purpose for us. We have this sense. The only problem is, looking under the sun, you'll never figure it out. You're always longing without the answer. We know there's something bigger. We know there's something eternal. We know there's some great plan. You can just never get the wide-angle lens to see it all to make sense of it. You're too finite. You're too narrow. You're too small. You only have your narrow experience to go by, and yet we ache. We long for something more because we know there is something more. That's what he's put in our hearts. We can just never find the answers to ourselves. We can never make sense of it. Imagine you go to the movie theaters, and you got your ticket, and then you stumble into the wrong theater, the wrong movie. You, you know, you're out to see some Avengers flick or something, and then you walk into the middle of a, a re-showing of Lord of the Rings. You're not familiar with the story, <laughs> you haven't seen them. You're like the three people in America that have never seen these movies and so you just stand there and you watch for a few minutes. It's Return of the King. You see Frodo. He's caught in this giant web. And it's the dark layer of Shelob. That's this elephant-sized spider that's trying to eat him. It's scary. It's dark. The main character seems to die. He seems to lose the ring. It just all seems so hopeless. And then you leave those few minutes. You're wondering, why do people love these movies? But of course, you've only caught a little bit of the story. Your perspective is so small. You weren't able to see the beginning. You didn't know what they were really about anyway. And you didn't get to see the end. You know so little of the story. You can't understand it. Furthermore, without the perspective of the beginning and the end, you even misunderstand and misinterpret the little bit you did see. Don't you see? And yet we assume in our snapshot of time in this creation that you, on your own, that you can figure out this whole God, eternity, meaning of life, is there afterlife stuff all on your own? No. Like we studied and highlighted from this book, but into the book of Romans. There's a futility built into this by design, do you see? And you wouldn't be stuck here, looking down here, but you would be forced, i got to look elsewhere. Life can never make sense. Life can never be understood just on your own. You can't take it all in. You're too finite for that. But God gives man everything, he says, in its beautiful, perfect time. And yet he also gives us this longing in our hearts to make sense of it, but we'll never find the answer only looking to ourselves. So if you dive into this world only looking under the sun to find your meaning, to make sense of your world, you can stop now because that's a vain, dead-end pursuit. You won't look, be able to look at the passing, transient things of the world and find the answer to that eternal ache in your heart. So then, how are we to live in the meantime? Are we to just joyfully go along for the ride? Well, sort of. <laughs> Look at verse 12. Look at Solomon's conclusion next. I perceive there's nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. And then on to verse 13. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all this toil. That's God's gift to man. You see, this is what God has given us. 
God has worked to make everything perfect in its time, but He has given eternity in our hearts such that we would not figure out life on our own. That, that's not for us, but what's for us? To enjoy what He's given. Enjoy, drink, eat, enjoy life, find the good as it comes. What this means is you need to know your limits. That He is God and you are not. You see. We are not our own masters. No matter how much we strive to be. Too often we're driven by discontent to strive, to find, to squeeze out more joy, more joy, more joy. We're always pulling against the leash, choking ourselves, trying to go the wrong way. All the while our master is taking us on this pleasant walk if we would just stop pulling against the leash. God's gift to us, what He's permitted us to have, is not the answers that is looking in the sun, but some joys and delights along the way. And to truly enjoy those, you have to trust Him, and then you just have to stop. Let Him control the seasons. You can't discover the point of it all, but you can trust the one who does. The whole point is that our inability to control, to manipulate the settled situation of God's decree, what it does, it casts us all back on Him. It turns us back to Him, to God alone. Look at verse 14. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor can anything be taken from it. God has done it. Why? So that people would fear Him. It turns you back to Him. It makes you dependent upon Him. It makes you revere Him, consider Him, worship Him, trust Him. Because you can't do this. Because again, if we're pining after the steering wheel of our life or to control the leash, it's impossible. It's a vain, empty, foolish pursuit. It's a waste of a desire. You can't change that anyways. Look at verse 15. That which is, already has been. That which is to be, already has been. And God seeks that which has been driven away. There is an inalterable order, even cycle to life, about these times and seasons. But they're not given over to happenstance, random chance, or fate. God pursues he watches over it all just as He wrote it out and planned it, executing it in time perfectly. We can't figure it out. We can't manipulate it. But God has it all figured out. It's all set in motion. So will you trust Him? Are there delights and joys on this road that God has given you, but you're missing them? As you're striving for something else, you're longing for a different season, you want a different time, different circumstances, clouded your ability to see the good things He has given you right now. You feel that? Are you missing the joy of your young kids? Are you missing the actual good things of your, your job currently? Okay. Are you discontent with your marital status or with your standard of living? What goods and joys can you find in your life right now? Are you, or are you even looking for them? Being so preoccupied with what you don't have and what you can't find the answer for. Solomon reminds us you can't figure it all out, you can't control the seasons and the times, but you can trust the God who can and does, especially for your good if you are in Christ. May we trust Him. And we have to trust Him because as we go on in this life, apart from God, life doesn't seem just. Life will never seem just right. So there's this abiding, great, and sorrowful confusion to our life. Is that we find great injustices in this broken world. And without the perspective of God's future judgment... That abiding injustice is just a tragic meaninglessness. One that will never be remedied. So first off, Solomon here, he looks just under the sun. Keeping God out of his mind, and he sees wickedness 
where he should find righteousness. Verse 16. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. This is the double evil, isn't it? Not only does all kind of injustice and unfairness appear in this world, but, but then the only places under the sun to, to requite that, to, to remedy that, even in those places you find injustice. In the place of justice, the place of righteousness, you, you, said, you think like our law courts, or maybe the hearing before the king or the magistrates. You know, this is where the peasants or the citizens, they can go and appeal when they've been wronged by the rich, or they've been wronged by the powerful, or another fellow citizen. And instead of having their wrongs righted, they find the wrongs against them enshrined. Commended as wickedness reigns in the halls of justice. And when you've been there, that's a most hopeless situation. And a one not uncommon in the history of our country, let alone in the history of the world, and even currently right now. Though it's good and right thought to hope for justice, it's just too much to expect. <coughs> that all to be rectified in this life under the sun. And that's hopeless. But as soon as you turn your eyes beyond the sun, we find hope again, because we find justice. Look at verse 17. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked. So under the sun, justice might never be achieved. And it won't actually, certainly in full. But there is one day in due time, the perfect season, God will judge the righteous and the wicked. Now what gives Solomon this assurance that this is the way it's going to happen? How can he be so sure? Well, he goes on to tell us as we go on in verse 17. Again, I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked for there is a time for every matter and for every work. Again, he rehearses this control of God over history and the seasons of her life. The wise king, he reprises those words that he opened the chapter with, that there is a time for every matter under heaven. And so it is with God as the judge. We know by faith that he's a good God, and so then he's a good judge, just as Abraham confessed in Genesis 18. Remember what did he say? Will not the judge of the earth do right? He will. Oh, he will. But I don't see right going on under the sun, which means we know by faith that after death, the wicked will be judged. God will set the wrongs aright. All will be judged. All will be set right. But it's all going to happen in God's perfect timing. In other words, not even the injustices of this world under the sun they, they, they have a world beyond God's control. They may be permitted for a time, for a season, again under the sun, but one day He will set all things aright and beautifully so. But as Solomon continues, though, here's the trick. Here's the catch. This setting aright of all things, this accomplishment of ultimate justice, it might arrive after you're gone. Justice actually will ultimately be accomplished beyond your purview, beyond your scope of reckoning. Again, your, your frame of reference is just too narrow. And so it is, without God in the picture, injustice reigns, injustice wins. And again, Solomon says, it appears this way under the sun by design. Once again, look at verse 18. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them. Why? That they may see that they themselves are but beasts. God is testing our hearts. The notion means here to make things clear, to help us to see. To see things as they actually are, not as we simply perceive them. He's testing us and showing us. Namely what? That we are really not that much different than beasts, than animals. Well, how does he justify that? What's his sense for that? That is, namely, whether there is injustice or no, we all die. Just like dogs and deer and squirrels or whatever creatures you might have found on the road this morning. We are all quite finite like they are. 
We are mortal as creatures. And of course, what do we find? God is not. And how does God show us this? Well, in a word, death. Death shows us that we are much more like beasts than we care to admit. And it comes no surprise in this book that Solomon finds that rather frustrating. Frustrating futility. Verse 19. What happens to the children of man and what happens to beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath. Man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity, his favorite word. We are creatures made of dust that in death return to it. Verse 20. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and to dust all return. We all, beast and man alike, go to one place, to the dust, to the ground, to be buried. People, like animals and pets, we know they come and they die and they go away. And we don't see them anymore. You don't hear from them anymore. And when your information is only based on what you experience under the sun, if that's the basis for your making your judgments, your conclusions about what you see and experience, you're going to start asking questions then like, verse 21, who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth? Especially to consider our evil and injustice. Looking under the sun, the death of the beast and the human seems the same. Alive one moment, and then a corpse the next, with no evidence about what happens ultimately next. And again, to work it all back then, this whole section of injustice, if there's no afterlife, then there's no judgment. And then the injustice of the world, it just is. It makes no sense. Injustice wins. And if that's the case, then Solomon suggests, verse 22, so, it, the, so I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Just enjoy life. Don't get too worked up about the injustices, apparently. Why? Because you can't fully rectify them. You can't work them all out. I mean, what can you do about it? What does it matter? Does it matter? Now we know, in view of eternity, of course. Even the injustices that go on now, they matter, big time. And to relieve them and rectify them, it's an excellent good. But again, if you're only looking under the sun without God in view, you have to ask in the end, what's the point? You'll never fix them all. You'll never fix them for good. And who knows, even the ones that you fixed, once you're gone, I'm pretty sure they're going to come back. And so he ends all of this with this final question about life after death. Verse 22. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? If man can never figure out what happens after death, then life never seems just. It never will be. And we'll never figure it out, anything beyond this. Who knows? Who can bring us to see? Well, of course, with the Word of God. Who knows? What about the one who died and has come back from? He knows. Of course, it's true that you never on your own can figure it out or, or see the end. But God has told us in His Word what happens and what happens after death. And Christ died for our sins, actually, and then He rose from the dead, really, to announce to all, yes, indeed, justice is coming. The afterlife is real. And you can find mercy for your many sins at my feet, Christ says, if you come, if you repent, if you turn. Who knows what will be after death? Well, Christ does. And He has done everything to prepare you for it, if you will trust Him. Yeah. In 1 Corinthians 15, 17, the Apostle Paul reasons like this. He says, Now if Christ had not been raised from the dead, your faith is futile. And you were still in your sins. That, that key word, futile, in the Greek translation of Ecclesiastes, that's the word vanity that we see over and over again. He's saying your faith is futile, it's vain, it's empty. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, life makes no sense. It is simply empty futility if Christ did not come back from the dead. You were stuck where Solomon is at the end of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. You're stuck, confused. But even worse, without Christ's resurrection, Paul's saying you're not just stuck in confusion, but you're stuck with your sins. 
You are stuck with the guilt, with this nagging feeling that there is some wicked injustice in your own heart that you do not want justice for. You know you sin. You feel with that eternity in your heart, there's some reckoning, and you're not prepared for it. But of course, this is the glory of the gospel. The greatness of our Christ. Not only or simply did He come back from the dead to, to tell us and show us, oh yeah, there's an afterlife. But in His rising, He prepares us for it by dealing with that judgment of God. Right? By dealing with our sins. By dying for our sins. By taking the death and punishment we had earned. And His righteousness or His resurrection proves that if you trust in Christ, if you would say, would you take my sins, that He has done it. That He has won. That He has defeated death. And not just for Him, but for you. But for you He has done it. You will look to Him. And if you're in Christ already, will you live by that assured hope and future after this life? Because Paul's point in that passage in 1 Corinthians, our view of the assured resurrection. That, that's going to change how you're going to live now under the sun. By what you prioritize now, what you focus on now, even as you live. Here's what he says, 1 Corinthians 15, 19. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, think under the sun, we are all people most to be, what does he say? Pity. We hold on to Christ for the hope for the glory of not this life, but the next one. Such that those living under the sun, those who live under the sun, those looking to this life only, they pity us. They're sad for us. Perhaps because we sacrifice too much. Perhaps because we're giving so much away of our time and our resources. Perhaps because we're taking lesser paying jobs for, in their mind, no explicable reason. Or we choose to live in a smaller house. Or we leave the comforts of this life and this country and this family for the sake of the gospel. They look at us and they say, oh, those poor Christians. And that would be true if there was no resurrection. That would be true if you couldn't know what's after this life. But we can. And we do. By the promise of the gospel sealed and delivered by the resurrected and alive Jesus Christ, find your joy there. Find your satisfaction ultimately there. For it's only there, beyond the grave and in the gracious presence of your loving Christ. Only then and there, this foggy, confusing life will all come together to the glory of the Father who sent Him and the Jesus who bought Him. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under His feet. When all things are subjected to Him, then the Son Himself will also be subjected to Him who put all things in subjection under Him, that God may be all in all. Let's long for that day. Let's thank Him for it.